Hello, Stone Apes and others who are curious about the healing powers of psychedelic medicines. Welcome to the Stone Ape Reports. I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I talk to another Stone Ape, somebody who has experienced the transformational powers of psychedelics, or with a practitioner who works with these medicines. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Tanya de Young, who shared her story of trauma stemming from her family's Holocaust survival and her journey into psychedelics, as well as the amazing work that she and her husband are doing in the nonprofit field of psychedelic therapy. So please enjoy this episode with Tanya de Young. Tanya, thank you so much for joining me here on the Stone Dave Reports. It's a real honor to have you here as uh, one of our first guests as we get this thing going. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an absolute honor to be uh, here with you. Well, thank and you. Thank you. I love all the work that you're doing and why you're doing it. It's uh, very meaningful. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Ho- hopefully we're helping some people. So, um, and we'll just jump right in. So we're here to talk about, you know, transformation through psychedelics and stone dape stories or whatnot. So, and you're obviously, and we'll get into a lot more details about all the amazing things you have going on but you're obviously deep into promoting the benefits of psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy. So if you could kind of share your own origin story, you know, what, what brought you to this and what was going on in your life before you found this and what was your experience? I know I read something about the Netherlands and your husband. Mm-hmm. So you know, maybe share your yeah. story. with. Me. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm one of these people like that has never been into any substances that are going to take me out of control. So, yeah. for example, I, I've never really got drunk. Um, I don't even drink any alcohol at all. Um, I've never smoked, you know, marijuana or anything like that. I don't even drink mm. coffee. Um, <laughs> wow. Sounds like I'm a really boring person. So the way that, you know, I've got high in the past has been through through probably my singing and my creativity and my work as a performer. Um, yeah in particular and entering transcendental, you know, really high consciousness through my, my performance and my music, that sort of thing. So it was a real surprise to me when I was reading Tim Ferriss's blog, which I received weekly when I came across an article that he had a link to, which was uh, an article by Michael Poland called the trip treatment, which was in the New Yorker magazine. Hmm. And Tim mentioned that he was investing a lot of money in trials at Imperial College at the time. This was about four years ago. And I read the article and for some reason um, it resonated incredibly strongly with me and I thought, wow, that is just incredible. And I showed it to my husband, Peter, and I said, Peter, we have to do this. We have to find a way to do, you know, this medicine. Right. And um, so he said, okay, well, you know, whatever you know, whatever you think sort of thing sounds interesting. And he sort of left it to me, like, for the next six months. And um, the first thing I did was I reached out to Robin Carhart Harris, Mm -hmm. uh, who's running the trials at Imperial, who was mentioned in the article. And he said, look, no, you know, there was no trials for really, you know, we don't have a diagnosis of a mental illness. And There was no trials around for healthy volunteers at the time. And so then they introduced us to the Psychedelic Society and none of their retreat weekends were running. So finally I got in touch with a private guide in the Netherlands um, and we flew overseas to, to have this session with him. And I should say, you know, that, you know, one of the primary reasons why I did this was that I'd never been, out of control in a sense. You know, I've always been a bit of a control freak and, you know, incredible sort of organiser and juggling a lot of balls and and very much, you know, in the doing plane um, of life. (laughs) And I had been feeling increasingly like there's got to be more than this, you know. And my own life story is such that, I'm the daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Mm. So for me, yeah. So for me, I knew that um, I would be carrying some sort of trauma that, you know, was leading to, you know, some of my sort of obsession with work, um, you know, that 
I would be carrying with me in, in terms of, you know, feelings of anxiety and so on. And then my husband, um, his father committed suicide when he was 13. Um, uh. And so, you know, though he felt that he'd come to terms with that, um, it really became evident in our ceremonies and subsequently in our ceremonies that, you know, there were things that we hadn't necessarily dealt with um, mm -hmm. and that there's this sort of trauma that had been in ourselves for decades, in my case, you know, through lifetimes really, <laughs> um, was still there and that we had to get rid of this if we were going to transcend and if we were going to significantly raise our consciousness and, and live our lives with the greater sense of meaning and purpose, fulfill our potential um, fully as, as human beings, as spiritual beings. And, um, you know, more than living on this plane that we see every day that really, you know, these medicines have taught me so much, but one of the greatest things have taught me is that there is not just this dimension that there's so much else going on and right. you know that we're really surrounded by by spirits and of course we are we are each a human spirit as well as you know our body we're so much right. more than our bodies and um yeah so that's really what happened we this experience this very first experience we had was a heroic dose of psilocybin. Um, wow, you started off with that. Well, actually, it was it was started with um, Syrian rue, the experience. So an hour before we we actually took the mm. psilocybin, um, we had a tea made of Syrian rue. Mm -hmm. And Syrian rue is an MAO, MAOI inhibitor, which means that it stops the medicine being broken down in your gut, so that you actually, when you take this psilocybin, it actually amplifies the experience massively. People wow. say between two and five times the actual dose that you take. So, um, it was one of those things that I was so, like I was so afraid of this, of that, that this might screw up my brain, that I would right. never be able to work again, that it was going to, you know, really have terrible effects on me because you know you, you hear these stories all about the stigma of these medicines and right so you know i'd seen all the science and research but part of me just was like oh my god you know how is this going to destroy everything you know and whereas my husband was just he hadn't really done a lot of the research so he just went into it but for both of us we were just like shot out of the universe <laughs> wow into another world um, yeah. and this was so, so powerful for us, this feeling of merging with everything and everything becoming a part of us that we did indeed, you know, um, feel that sense of awe and that sense of wonder and oneness and connection with everything. And even, you know, towards the end of the experience, both of us just said, well, well that is just the most, meaningful thing that uh, that yeah. we just about ever experienced like it was so profound uh the insights were so huge and 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 our connection to one another just immediately deepened um as well which was which was profound we also stopped eating meat altogether not that we ever ate a lot of it but i can't even step on an ant now let alone kill a cockroach you know right yeah. Um, it's just that feeling of every sentient, you know, being whether it's a tree or a, an animal, you know, we, we are all in this together. And, and just understanding that spirit world was very strong. Anyway, we didn't do the medicines for another year, but we, we really did a lot of research in that year. We started to read prolifically on the subject. Um, watch all the videos and started to to reach out to some of the people in this space and a year later we did our second experience which was an even higher dose and 
that really reinforced everything that we'd experienced in the first session. But as you'd know from having worked with the medicines, the medicines have this way somehow of knowing exactly what you need as a human being. Right. They so sure that, do. That psilocybin fits perfectly into that 5-H2A receptor, that serotonin receptor in your brain. And it's like mm-hmm. a you know lock fitting into a key. And every experience, I, I ask for, um, so I set intentions like, please show me whatever I need to see and please heal whatever needs to be healed. That's always right. part of my intention. I might have some other intentions, but, but that's particularly two of the things I ask for. And the medicine just takes me there. <laughs> and so I, I see everything from the cells within my body to, you know, lifetimes that I've never experienced. Of course, I've seen the Holocaust but I've seen other things that I was not even aware were part of my consciousness or part of my DNA. I don't know where they're coming from. Um, I connect to people in this world and also spirits that have passed on, like my father passed away wow. a few months ago. And um, I had an ex- in December I deliberately um, had an experience where I set intentions around connecting with him. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Anyway, that's that's a long answer to your question. Yeah, no, that's that's something you mentioned. You mentioned you know some insights you know that came through these ceremonies. Mm-hmm. What was there anything in particular that uh, was, ended up being really impactful that that helped you with the challenge that you were dealing with in life, or that mm-hmm. uh, opened opened up new possibilities to you? I mean, what kind of insights do you mm-hmm. remember going through, if you don't mind? Yeah. No. Look, I've had incredible insights. Um, also, on um, I've also done you know, work with some other medicines. So psilocybin has been the primary medicine for me, What I, you know, what is called the mother medicine or the God molecule. Um, but I've also worked with San Pedro cactus, mm-hmm. which also gave me some really profound insights. I've also worked with ayahuasca and MDMA. Um, so, yeah, quite a few different medicines now, but my husband and I are very intentional in this, and we only take these medicines, you know, every like between every four to six months. Right. Because we take time to integrate what's going on. So, yeah, so the insights have been everything from actually, you know, the insight from the medicines led us to, oh, in particular in my case, to set up the charity, Mind Medicine Australia. Mm-hmm. Like actually, you know, if these medicines are having this impact on, on us, my husband and I had previously set up four other charities, which have all been very successful in the spaces of social inclusion, women's homelessness, hmm. microfinance, um, poverty alleviation in Africa and so on. And wow. so, so when we first did this, and particularly after the second time, we thought, well, if this is having this impact on, on us, our lives, our relationship, our relationships with others, Imagine if we could make these medicines available to people who are experiencing disadvantage and dis- disability and, you know, who are feeling lonely and disconnected and isolated, which is a growing epidemic in our society. And, you know, what we realised was that at the base of all disadvantage lies mental illness, just about always. Right. And if we could treat mental illness, then we could actually help people to live meaningful lives. Yeah, absolutely. What, what a gift that would be. So that's probably the greatest insight. But I've had lots of other insights. Like just recently I had a ceremony where I asked about the, the virus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the insights that I got there or one of the really strong images I got was of all the nation's um, flags being burnt in a giant bonfire, which to me is symbolic of the fact that you know, rather than becoming all nationalistic, which is what people are predicting, that we're all going to shut our borders and let people in and, you know, um, stop people coming to our countries, that actually this is more than ever a wake-up call for humanity, that in the words of Ramdas, we're all walking each other home, Mm -hmm. that we all need to lift each other up. And 
that we're all in this together and people keep saying we're all in this together yet we're trying to build more walls between us and more boxes between us. Right. You know, it's yeah, ironic. but you had that insight that, and part of your journey, yeah. you had that insight that, hey, we are all in this together. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, all my work, Stuart, has been well before this um, experience has been about breaking down silos. It's hmm. been about what I call positive human collisions, which I talk about in my TED talk, uh, mm-hmm. Singing Together Changes the Brain. You know, I talk about how we can connect with people who are really different from us on a regular basis. And it's in that feeling of discomfort and being disagreed with potentially that going out of our comfort zone, that's where we get our greatest learnings, our greatest creativity and innovation happens when we experience what I like to call creative abrasion. And you don't get that from hanging out with people who are just like you on a right. regular basis. You know? Yeah. And so all my work has always been about how do we unite people? How do we become more inclusive? How do we listen to the diverse voices that are around us? Mm-hmm. And so all of this work has been really reinforced and highlighted through these medicines. That's awesome. And when you yeah. guys came, when you guys came out of this uh, ceremony, I mean, obviously you're doing amazing things now with, with your charity and, and, and all the other things you do. But when you came out of that, that first ceremony, were you ready to go out and shout this out to the world? Did you have mm-hmm. any kind of pushback from friends and family? Like, Hey Tanya, what are you doing now? This is a little yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah i mean yes i mean well certainly we did share this experience with our close friends and family and mm-hmm. i think a lot of people just thought we were had gone crazy right um, it's like you know well you know people would say things like oh well you've had a mystical experience but that doesn't mean that you know this is right for everyone or you know you've obviously had some kind of out-of-body experience um, you know, but, you know, what are you going on about? And, and, you know, it's like, you know, people who haven't used these medicines, it's very, very hard to explain to them. Yeah. And it can um, be scary to them. It can, like it was to me. Right. But, you know, people need to take that leap of faith because if you take these medicines and we've always taken these medicines with a guide, um, certainly in the first few years. I mean, really the first time we have done these, we've guided each other as well, but Mm -hmm. the first time we did these medicines together was really recently on this, I call it my COVID exploration ceremony. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, And we actually did the medicines together. But, you know, we're very, very careful. But in, you know, nine out of, say, the 10 experiences that we might have had in four years, we've had incredible guides. Uh, who've been there and you know when you take these medicines in an intentional way at the right dose with a guide they are so remarkably safe like there's been 119 recent trials and all currently taking place and there's been no adverse events in any of them not yeah. one you know um so um yeah and that's so, what you think you know, the key you think a real key is having a, a guide Somebody to be, I mean, in addition to the, the dose, and I, and I guess you would probably say set and setting, but a guide is very yeah. important to this process. That's right. So set and setting um, for us, you know, that means, you know, being in a, a place where you feel safe and held. I mean, if you can be somewhere near nature, I think that's really important. You know, even a forest by the ocean, somewhere yeah. like that is powerful. Um the music and the eye mask, I think, is fundamental to the experience. So going in um, is very important. We might take our eye mask off at the end of four or five hours and, and then you see nature in a whole different way. But I think it's important to use the eye mask. And, um, and of course, the music is profound. We'll talk about that further. The music is profoundly important. But, yeah, I mean, we had a lot of people who I think were like, you know, what has happened to these people? Like, I mean, Peter is like a, you know, one of the most successful merchant, you know, bankers, um, you know, in the history of this country. And yeah. I'm, you know, I've never taken any drugs whatsoever. And, um, and we're both 
what you'd call very upright citizens. You know, we've never taken yeah. any drugs in our whole life. So I think people thought, what is going on here? But now I think people understand what we're doing and in general people are very open uh, to what we're doing and they're actually very supportive. And, now, I mean, even my mother, um, you know, I, I, I'll say to her, I'm going to do a ceremony, mum. And she goes, oh, oh, my God, okay, okay, then, well, <laughs> tell me what you learn. <laughs> and, yeah. and then I share with, with her what I learn. And, um, you know, look, I honestly wish that all people who um, can be safe and held, you know, with these medicines in the right set and setting would have the opportunity yeah. um, and take the take take that step to go into this state because the learnings are just so profound and the feeling of boundless love and connection, you, you cannot replace that and it will come into your normal life, into your material yeah. plane life and it will take you to places you didn't think and it will also help you become more creative and help you join the dots more in your life normally that you just didn't expect. And yeah, it's, you know, my life has changed more than I could ever imagine. Because it, it, and is that what has kind of inspired you? I want to talk about the, the music and the playlist, but yeah. I think that this goes right into is, is that the passion that is behind mind medicine artist Australia in your, yeah. your nonprofit. I mean, as I feel it coming from you to talk about it. So is that yeah. what kind of got you to that? And, and you want yes. people to have these experiences, you want them to do it with the right guides, the right qualified yeah. people. I mean, is that what's behind all this? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, without question. I mean, you know, with those first two experiences separated by a year, it just came to us both that if, you know, as I said, if these experiences could be made available to people who are suffering, um, you know, mentally, physically, you know, this would literally say, in many cases, save people's lives um, yeah. and certainly change their lives for the better and their relationships and, you know, mean that the short time that we have on life is, you know, there is a profound sense of gratitude and a sense of, meaning and optimism for people, which is more needed than ever now. I mean, right. if ever that was needed, that is needed now. Yeah. But I should say that Mind Medicine Australia is completely focused on the use of these medicines in medically controlled environments. Mm -hmm. So our mission is to make sure that these medicines are provided to people who are screened properly uh, in medical environments uh, with the right support and then the right integration process following the medicine, se the medicine session uh, so that they can integrate these incredible experiences back into their work, their lives, their families, um, and really use the medicines as medicines uh, that are right. teaching them, you know, in an ongoing way. And so, our mission with the charity is that these become part of the toolkit for all doctors and their patients, particularly to begin with psychiatrists who are prescribing doctors. Yeah. But over time, you know, other medical practitioners. And so the key strategic objectives in that are we're building awareness and educating people through a range of events, screenings, webinars, uh, a global summit in November with the leading researchers and psychiatrists in the world coming to Melbourne. I mean, you and really also, do. You can drop some names if you want to. You've got some amazing people coming. Yeah. To the yeah. So, you know, all the leaders in this field, you know, not all of them, but the majority of them, people like Robin Carhart Harris, David Nutt, Ben Sessa, Rick Doblin, uh, people like Wade Davis. Yeah. Um, you know, look, just incredible people from around the world um, who are coming to Melbourne from all over the world. And, and part of that strategy also is we're setting up global, uh, sorry, national and regional, like metropolitan and regional chapters mm -hmm. throughout Australia and potentially Asia and New Zealand as well. And we're seeing ourselves as a hub really for the Asia Pacific region. We're also setting up the first professional development 
certificate in psychedelic therapies in the region. Mm -hmm. So we've brought one of the top clinical psychologists who worked on the Imperial College psilocybin trials to Melbourne to live in Australia, and she's developing and designing that course. Wow. With Janice Phelps from the California Institute of Integrative Studies. And that will start early in 2021. And we have a wait list of like over 250 psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, drug and alcohol counselors, GPs, and others um, on the wait list for that one, which will be released in the next few weeks. And then um, we're looking at setting up a, an Asia-Pacific Centre of Excellence for applied research and development um, of these medicines for the use in different conditions, ranging from, you know, anorexia and eating disorders to uh, PTSD to dementia, it might be ADHD, uh, OCD. There, there's so many conditions that could be potentially healed with these mm -hmm. medicines. And as you know, you know, over 50,000 patients were healed with these medicines in the 50s and 60s before the prohibition right. by Nixon. And then um, part of the Center of Excellence will also be looking at you know, the manufacture and growing of these med medicines in Australia, um, the rollout of clinics, uh, you know, the rescheduling and ethical frameworks for these medicines in Australia. And, yeah, it's, it's very exciting, really, what we're doing. We're really setting up the whole ecosystem for these medicines. And it's important to also say that my husband and I are doing this entirely as philanthropists. So we're nice. not wanting or needing to make money out of this. Uh, there mm -hmm. are many investors around who see psychedelic medicines as, as, you know, as an enormous industry, and they will and are becoming that. But right. I would say to every person who's out there and if there's investors listening that, you know, you want to set up a triple bottom line in your startup and your business so that you're doing this for the right reasons. If you really want these medicines uh, to be available, then make sure they're available and affordable to everyone who's suffering. Right. And um, we know that this, these medicines can only become available to the millions of people well, hundreds of millions of people suffering. And for-profit enterprises. Yeah. And that is amazing. You're doing all that. And yeah, I hope some of these investors will jump in. Like you said, I, I never heard that term, the triple bottom line. You mean the donations yeah. to charity and doing good? Yeah, I mean, I'm saying that anyone who sets up a for-profit commercial organisation from day one can set a mission that they're going to donate a percentage of their profits yeah. back to, you know, helping not-for-profits and supporting not-for-profits in this space. Yeah. Um, and I encourage that really strongly. Yeah, that's great. I love it. And I love what you guys are doing. Where, where do you see, and I don't know, maybe uh, in Australia or in that, uh, that area, um, where do you see psychedelics and psychedelic therapy going? What are your expectations? I mean, with well, the work you're doing, what are your goals? Is, yeah, well, our expectation is that, you know, when you go to a, a doctor and you say that you're suffering from some kind of certainly mental illness, yeah. that the doctor will not just give you the options of antidepressants or psychotherapy, but will actually say, well, actually, there's also psychedelic assistance psychotherapy yeah. and the remission rates are at the moment between 60 to 80 percent versus maximum of about 35 percent with those others um and you know that you could be healed um in a, just a few sessions with integration psychotherapy you know providing support for the medicine sessions right so that you actually give patients the opportunity to have access to these medicines in medically controlled environments and we're not suggesting that people can take home the medicines and you know take them wherever they want they actually need right. to be supervised and that this becomes part of the toolkit for doctors because all the doctors and psychiatrists we speak to tell us they cannot get the majority of patients well through the current right treatments right so most 
but they say to us, well, you know, mate, out of 20 patients, we might get one well through the current treatments. Mm. So that clogs up the whole system. That means with this epidemic now of increased mental illness through the virus, yeah. for example, there's, there's no psychiatrists and psychologists who have space on their books because they're not getting people well through the current treatments available. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And the way that that can happen is two ways. One is through regulation of these medicines, which is, you know, happening through the phase three trials and the phase two B trials in the U S and Europe. Mm -hmm. But the other way that these medicines are becoming available, like, and are available now is through what are called special access schemes or compassionate use schemes where a psychiatrist um, who's run out of options for a patient who's in danger can apply to the regulators to treat patients uh, with these medicines Hmm. through the special access scheme. And that's a scheme that's been used to make medicinal cannabis available um, hmm. on a much broader scale for people. Yeah. So that can occur as soon as now, you know, with yeah. the right psychiatrists and the right patients. Um, anywhere? It can have that. That scheme is available in the U.S., um, in okay. Switzerland and Israel and um, you know, hopefully sooner. I, I believe it's it's almost there, and if not already available in Canada, and of course, hopefully in Australia as well. Yeah, good, excellent. Yeah. Um, all right. Before before I ask you what else you want to share, I did want to jump back and talk to you yeah. about this music because obviously yeah. you're you're uh, an accomplished, amazing singer, musician, and so I saw somewhere out there, and and some of the information that you sent me about some playlists that you put together. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I wanted to, to ask you kind of a two sides to this. One is you mentioned synesthesia, which is, yeah. um, I'm very curious about that, but also in general for a psychedelic journey. So I don't know if you can kind of wrap both of those together or talk about this and yeah, about yeah, sure. your music. Yeah. I mean, the music is incredibly important and, I, we were very lucky in that the, the first guide that we had, the Dutch guide, um, had an incredible playlist and, you know, we felt like we were part of that music. We felt like we were, you know, if there was a strings, for example, we felt like we were the strings or the piano. We felt like we were literally part of the piano or if there was a chorus of choir of voices, then you know, I could literally see, it was like I could see the voices singing that music or the organ. The organs are really interesting. Uh, organs and gongs, it's like you can mm. see them. You can see all the different um, parts of those instruments when you're having these psychedelic medicines. And so what I did was I just started to download a whole lot of music um, that has either been sent to me or that I've heard or even music that I've composed myself or mm -hmm. others have composed for me. And then also taking all the different traditions of music um, through from sort of spiritual and transcendental music through to music of different cultures to classical music and contemporary music. And I've woven this into what I call my mushroom playlist. <laughs> nice. And it's like an eight hour playlist that I'm wow. adapting. And I've adapted this playlist in such a way that it takes uh, people who are having these medicines through the experience and through each stage of the journey. So it's like right through from, you know, if for example, you were to take Syrian Rue, which are peganum seeds, which are legal actually substances. So they're hmm. the substance I'm, I mentioned at the start. And they might. Mm -hmm. So you take those an hour before the psilocybin. So I've got music for that that takes you into a meditative state. And then when the experience starts, I use some Brian Eno. Um, and then I, I use a lot of music for the first, say, three to four, three hours, let's say, first three hours, that is very, it's non-recognisable to most people. It's It ranges from crystal bowls to, to gongs to hmm. 
mm-hmm. to voices, but they're very, you know, there's no melodic structure to the music. And, but it's tuning in with you so that you're, it's taking you, it's helping you to tr- transcend and to um, become one with a higher consciousness and the spiritual plane. Yeah. And wow. then after about, say, three hours, um, I start to weave in some more music that is um, classical, but but in sp- it's not traditional classical music either. It might be some Max Richter or it might be some other classical music that's sort of been improvised on hmm. in a sense. And so it's still not as recognisable to people because I think it's really important that people don't connect back into this, this material world too soon in the, in the ceremony. Hmm. And then um, I start to then bring in some other classical music, some more traditional classical music, but really, really beautiful, like just the most angelic music. And then also some songs that have some themes like for example there's a song i use called humble yourself um, Hmm. which is really important because it's all about people realizing the connection they have with their brothers and sisters and all brothers and sisters not just real brothers and sisters but yeah uh, are there lyrics or they actually spoken words in the song yeah humble yourself yeah so then starts to really have some lyrics that start to really connect you to broader humanity and and themes of suffering and right and rising up and lifting each other up and so on and then i also have some of my own music in there so pieces from my recent albums um i use quite a lot of pieces also from kirtan um chanting later yeah. on in the ceremony and then you know a bit of contemporary music as well and um, you know, even things like Viva La Vida towards the end, just to, <laughs> you know, because you start feeling like you want to move and dance. Yeah. And, um, and it's really interesting. Like people have said to me, oh, my God, that is like the ultimate playlist for ceremonies. And I've actually shared that playlist with a few guides who I really respect. And mm-hmm. they've started to use that playlist. And what's been interesting is that, I've used that playlist with some other people as well and they've said, oh, my God, it was like just when I thought the music couldn't get any better, it was like the next piece was like even more profound and I became like part of this music and I could feel like my whole being was the instrument and that the music helped me to open my boundaries even more and to go into, in some cases it might be, you know, a galactic or cosmic, you know, feeling of flying in space or in other times it might be that I'm whirling through the whole universe or I'm swimming in a river or um, I'm under the sea. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, so the music really helps uh, certainly the people that I know and have worked with these playlists to transcend more quickly and more effectively into other states. Hmm. Well, that's amazing. That's uh, so it's a big part, not only a guide and set and setting and dose, but also this this amazing playlist. Is is this available somewhere? Do you do you sell it? Do you have the do you have it listed out somewhere? How or am, do you is it something you guys offer? Of, yeah, I haven't I haven't shared it publicly yet. I'm thinking about what to do with it. Um, okay. And um, you know, I, I share it with people who are close and yeah. Um, and you know there are there are more people developing music. I think there's some playlists potentially on Spotify that some other people have been using. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm you know I'm always open to to seeing what I can do, and I always want to share with people. Yeah. Uh, this sort of thing, and you know I don't have a profit motive, so. Right. I want, to, I want to help people to experience these medicines and get the most healing possible. Oh, that's awesome. That's really awesome. So um, what else, you know, as we wrap this up, what else, is there anything else you want to share? Is there anything else I have not talked to you about or asked you about? Um, What else do you want to get out there? 
Look, yeah, I want to encourage people to, to jump on mindmedicineaustralia.org um, and okay. have a look at yeah. what we're doing and certainly have a look at our summit, which is taking place in November and mm -hmm. we'd love people to sign up. We've already sold over 250 tickets, so it's undoubtedly going to sell out. Wow. Um, is there a, a virtual aspect to that so somebody from the States could well, buy a, a virtual ticket or participate somehow or is it only live? It's only live, and okay. if for some reason, you know, our borders are still locked up by then, then we'll move it to, okay. to next year because the way that we look at this is really important. There's a lot of virtual seminars taking place now, but to really connect with other people, I still believe you really have to be there, yeah. To be in a room with people and to experience these experiences together, that's where the real magic and transformation takes place for people. And I've devised um, eight previous global conferences in the innovation space. And we wow. always, the, the, the conferences and summits that I create are not like your normal conferences and summits. And you have to be there because we take people on a journey that is not just a speaker speaking on the stage. We actually use visuals and music and huh. other experiences to help people really connect to the content that's being shared by presenters. Nice. So that's really tricky to do using a sort of what I call a very sort of 3D at most, 2D yeah. sort of An immersive like experience. Things. Yeah, yeah. So we take people right into the experience and that the learning that occurs through that is far greater. Yeah. So I'm loath to do a – I mean, we're doing other webinars at the moment. I encourage people to join our webinars, which are free. Um, okay. At the moment. And those are on the website? Yeah, mm -hmm. they're in our event section, as is okay. the summit. We also have a massive learn section on our website where you can read and, and watch a whole lot of really, really high-quality content on the medicines. And okay. also people can, you know, join our social media on all the different platforms and follow us. And the other thing I'd really encourage people to do who are listening is to is to donate and support us. There's ways that people can support us monthly and, um, you know, just jump on board and know that our intentions are entirely pure and they're not going to change. And, um, right. you know, we are going to make sure that these medicines become available to as many people as we can. That's part of the gift we want to give. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So we can help, we can donate. Is there, and I'll put a link to that on the, uh, on the podcast, on the website. What, is there anything else that people can do to, to help? Or is it really pr pretty much uh, get the funding in there? Well, I think um, spreading the word about Mind Medicine Australia and, and supporting mm -hmm. in different ways that they can is, is really great. And just, yeah, coming to the summit and sharing the word about that. And if they want to, if they want to become a psychedelic therapist, then register for the training. Hmm. And, you know, you've probably got people listening from all over the world. So there's lots of scope with that. Yeah, we sure um, do. So hopefully we can get somebody over there. Yeah. And also I encourage people to watch and share my TED Talk. Um, a lot of my philosophies around creativity and certainly the work I've done in my previous charity, the With One Voice program, is on my TED Talk. And it's nearly, I think it's nearly at 100,000 views now. So it's going, wow. going well. That's awesome. I will put a link to that or even embed it on the, uh, on the podcast so people can get there. Yeah, and I suppose the other thing would be, and I'll send you the links for this, is um, connecting people to my music, my, my particular albums, mm -hmm. which are available through iTunes and my website. And so my website okay. is Tanya De Jong, T -A -N -I -A -D -E -J -O -N -G dot com dot A-U. No, just dot com, sorry. Tanya De Jong okay. dot com. All right. We'll get that on there too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Tanya, thank you so much for all this great information. I really enjoyed hearing your story and hearing about all the amazing things that you and your husband and all the, all your volunteers are doing. So I'm just super grateful mm -hmm. for both your time and all the work you're doing. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure. And I just encourage everyone to go and dance with the stars. There you go. Go dance with the stars. I like that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That concludes this edition of the Stoned Ape Reports. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Instagram at Stoned Ape Comedy and subscribe to our newsletter at www.stonedapecomedy.com. Again, thanks for listening and catch you next time, Stoned Apes.